because you're jumping back into the gut. Oh, let's hey, go. Coach. Welcome to the Basketball Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Oliver. I appreciate you joining us for this week's podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and visit basketballimmersion.com for more coaching resources and access to all the basketball podcasts. I hope you will give us a shout out on social media, on Twitter at Bball Immersion, or on Instagram at Basketball Immersion to help me continue to share the game. Enjoy the episode. Coaches, super excited to welcome Mike Kelly with us today. Mike is the head coach of Cairns Taipans of the National Basketball League of Australia, the NBL. And the club in his first year finished with a 6-22 and record and finished in last place. And the reason I share that is because in his second year, his team improved and nearly tripled their wins from the previous season to finish third in the league with a 16-12 record, and he won coach of the year. Welcome to the podcast, Mike. Chris, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So quite the turnaround is the first place to go. And uh, we're going to dive deep into what I think is relevant to coaches at all levels. And that's that process of getting a team to its next level, whatever that next level is. And I know that coaches are, are internally optimistic, but going into that first year, did you know it was going to be a struggle? Well, I knew it was going to be a, a struggle to get everything in line, I guess, because we we came in, Cairns had been a, a highly successful program, kind of always batted above its weight under Aaron Fern, who was a great coach here, who you would know. And, and they always had good teams, but always with a little bit less talent probably than, than the rest of the league. And he had built something cool up here. And then a bunch of guys left when he left. And so it was not totally starting over, but we had, uh, like I signed like two days before free agency opened and there was one player who had taken up his option, Nate Jawai, who's still here. And I'm grateful for that. And, uh, and so it was a little bit of a kind of build quickly through free agency and try to establish um, everything really from that point on. So yes, we knew there was um, some obstacles, but uh, I liked our group and uh, I knew it was going to be a competitive group that could win games. And uh, I thought we'd win more uh, and battle for a playoff spot. But uh, I guess that is the eternal optimist that all coaches are. Well, the internal optimist is that we often go into games thinking no matter what, that we can find a way to win the game. And, sure. and unfortunately, that's not the reality. And I've been through that as a coach, and I think every coach has been through that. But you still have to, even in the middle of struggles, and I think you went through a 14-game losing streak, if I remember, that first season that's as right. well. So, you know, yeah. it's almost even more remarkable that you were able to keep them up and get them, again, building towards that next season. Well, one, one thing, we won our first game. And uh, we beat, uh, you know, a good Brisbane Bullets team and a great coach in Andre Lamanis. And I thought, dang, this, is, this isn't this is as hard as I thought it was going to be. And, uh, yeah, then we lost 14 in a row. And, uh, yeah, had had some things that we had to go through there. But, um, you know, we, had a, we did have a good group of guys. And uh, I think the guys that signed up with us that we chose um, started to establish something. And... Uh, and so we battled through through to the end and uh, right down to the the last game, um, being on the road, we our guys fought. And uh, that's that's what started, I think, the kind of the base for for our our group here. I remember the worst team I ever coached. We won three games, but we won three of those four games near the end of the year. So, you know, you could tell that even though we weren't good yet we were on our way in the sense that it's really hard to judge. Cause again, what do you come back to? You come back to outcome. So maybe what were some of the other things in that first year that gave you an indication that you were on the right track, even if the wins weren't coming? Yeah, I think, I think uh, probably the biggest thing is we were competitive and had a chance to win. And I think as a coach uh, or competitor, as long as you put yourself in a position to win games, um, you feel good about having that opportunity and kind of what you have. So, you know, we did lose 14 in a row. Um, we needed everybody to be kind of playing right at their peak and, uh, 
and we had a couple of injuries to rotation guys and and there was a couple things one that gave um gave other guys an opportunity to step up and play and i and i'm picturing uh Fab Kurslovich, who's now on our roster, he was a development player that year, so not on the official roster, gave him an opportunity and he took it with both hands. And uh, so it gave us a chance to kind of see guys who could compete and and step up from being, you know, college players in the States to professional uh, everyday players here against men. That was one thing. And I think for myself, um, it taught me a lot as a first year head coach. I had worked for a lot of great coaches as an assistant, uh, both in college in the States and here in Australia. And it's still, um, you know, I think your, your philosophy is ever evolving uh, or, or hopefully at least you're improving and building on it. And for me, that first year, I gave our guys a lot of freedom offensively and we had some, you know, some, good offensive players like Mello Trimble was here, Devin Hall, DJ Newbill were our Americans and, uh, but they were all young and, and learning. And, uh, and so I probably, uh, gave the guys a little too much freedom because as a player that that's what I was always craving was the ability to kind of use your smarts out there on the floor and, and show that you could handle freedom. And, uh, and I think as a group, we couldn't handle that freedom um, as well as I thought we might. So pulling back the reins a little bit and and um, putting in a few more, um, you know, barriers to guys just going off and doing their own thing and and trying to get guys to work better together as a group. Um, so I learned I learned a lot um, along with my staff on on how we wanted to play and how we needed to play to be uh, competitive. So. That that was a continual learning experience that first year, especially. It's it's definitely a learning experience, and uh, you know, success proved out the next year. And uh, getting into a little bit of that first year, then the main part of a lot of what a lot of coaches talk about when they take over a program is that you've got to establish your culture and your philosophy. So, can you take us through that a little bit about how you did that in that first year? Yeah, you know, with a with a whole new group, we had. Um, we ended up signing one more player, Alex Loughton, who was our captain that year. So he and Nate Jawai were the returners. And um, and really, we had to establish everything from there. Um, I knew I wanted to, to just put in a, a competitive, um, you know, philosophy was basically compete when it came down to it um, and and compete together in an unselfish way. Um, throwing everybody together uh, and being a little probably less talented than most groups in the league, um, it really showed out in as far as us being able to to hold to the values and and not go um, selfish as a group. And uh, and so I think we, you know, I, I look back on one one game in particular. We went over to New Zealand. We were in the middle of that 14-game losing streak, um, and we didn't defend. And I, there was a couple of older guys on the team and a couple of younger guys, and I was trying to uh, kind of coach everybody and, uh, you know, rest a couple of the older guys sometimes at practice. And it, it was – and then we were going out and – in this game in New Zealand, we scored fine. We had a hundred points, but uh, we lost by 15. And it was just in a 40 minute game. I was, I came back just ecstatic that we were even close in that game, the way we played. I thought we were horrible and I didn't think we competed. And I knew that a lot of that was on me because of, I think I had kind of pandered to the guys to say, oh, if you're okay, you can go, you know, you're 35 years old. You don't need to, practice hard today or you know let's let you shoot free throws and I came back and I just said I don't care what happens the rest of the way everybody who competes has a chance to play and I think I thought that I was going to be like that from the start but during that time um, and and we were competitive but this showed out to me that um, 
as a group, we had to compete every day in everything we did. And so even if we only went for 45 minutes, um, 30 minutes of that training was going to be competitive. And if guys were sort of guys were hurt, um, we deal with that and, uh, and we bring that competitive nature to the next game. And, uh, and I think that was for us, for this program, I, I really believe that was a, a turning point. Um, not so much that we didn't compete before, but, um, it became our kind of cornerstone to compete every time we step on the floor and, uh, and not just say it, but do it. And, uh, and I think that was a builder right there and, and helped to establish the philosophy. Yeah, it's really cool to hear. I think that's, that's pretty normal in the sense that even though our philosophy might be a little bit more permissive in terms of freedoms and different things like that, I found the same thing that when you first take over, you, you, you have to build to that because you have to first establish again, as you said, your culture, your philosophy, and in this case, competitiveness, before you start to give some of these permissive freedoms that uh, ultimately, I think, help you get to that next level. Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, I think we, that group um, showed that they were a good group. I think uh, the group was better than the record. And uh, we lost some close ones um, that I thought we could have got. And, uh, and we didn't put ourselves in position uh, by, by playing an established way. And uh, when it came down to that, I, I totally myself uh, learned from that. And, uh, and the next year tried to try to be better right from the, uh, from the first time we stepped on the court together. Support for the basketball podcast comes from Bet Online. Football is in full effect and the NBA is back. You might not be at a game this year, but you'd still be in on the action at Bet Online. Bet Online is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on everything imaginable this season. From game spreads and totals to team, player, and coach props, Bet Online gives you more options to wager than any place online. Head to Bet Online today and use promo code ARMCHAIR to take advantage of all the great sign-up bonuses. Bet online, your online sports experts use promo code armchair, all in capitals. Now back to the podcast. Well, and uh, it showed obviously uh, not just improvement within that season, but uh, building into the next year. But before we get there, take us through the off season then, you know, from that year, that was a struggle in terms of the record to the next season. What were some of the off season priorities I'm imagining, obviously, upgrading personnel, but what were some other things? Yeah, well, you know, it, it was um, for us that was that was big. Um, the personnel and uh, and really having the time to do that. We just reevaluated everything as as teams do, and uh, and the first thing was was personnel, and this was our chance to to take our time and. Um, go after players who not only were say long and athletic and, you know, we felt like uh, we're very good in this league or could be very good, but um, kind of find that um, hopefully undervalued guys. So I, I thought we did a good job in, uh, in going after guys, local guys in our league um, that were solid players, but we thought could take a step up and, uh, and then we got fortunate with a couple guys. So for us, that was a huge way for us to improve was just um, have better players. Um, so we lost some some good guys, but we also were able to pick up some great local guys. And uh, and for us, that was we went in saying we need to improve in this position, this position, in this position. And uh, and I think some of that is skill and picking guys. And then I think also. Uh, we got a little bit lucky with uh, the kind of the character of guys that we did pick up and the competitiveness um, was even greater probably than, than we first thought. Um, so bringing, bringing those guys in, that was a, a big, um, a big first step. And, uh, and the ability to say, I mean, you hear it all the time. If you want a, a great, tough defensive minded player, then, you need to recruit a great, tough, defensive-minded player, and uh, I think that was 
I'm going on about it because I do think it was huge to uh, to bring in guys that um, had the ability to compete at a really high level in this league. Um, and so that was that was huge for us. Um, as a as a coach, things things that I thought were really important. I kind of mentioned the first year um, with with our team. I wanted to have a uh, guys that could play freely and and attack. So so we tried to push the ball in transition and look for early opportunities. And I was really um, encouraging to our guys to say, "Hey, I want you to I want you to really look to attack." Now. Um, I think I learned that, as you said, you, you know, it's hard to give guys freedom and, and not explain well enough what you want them to do. So we were able to this second year, um, kind of give the, give the guys freedom, but just a little more structure in, uh, not so much in transition, but in secondary. And, uh, and then when it came down to it, as a group, establish how we wanted to play, and then individually to sit guys down and, and define their roles better. And, and for me, that was a, a really big one. And that one went on throughout the season because some guys came in thinking, this is, this is how I see myself. And, uh, and that wasn't what I thought was best for the team. So we had some good discussions with um, every player on the team about what I thought their role was and what they thought their role was. And then, uh, what it, what was best for the team in the end. So you've mentioned competitiveness a few times, were there some things that you do in practice that foster this competitiveness and build on it as well beyond just personnel? For sure. We, um, you know, it's funny. There's, we're still dealing with this in the off season. I've been at teams where I've been an assistant coach and, and, uh, and the head coach has said, Hey, you, you're down at what this end and the other assistant coach is down the other end. You guys are calling fouls today. So you end up, you end up, uh, not coaching at all. And you end up just watching to see if somebody traveled or somebody, um, you know, somebody fouled or, and, and, the guys are playing and they're talking to you like you're the ref um, more so than, than being able to watch the, uh, the scrimmage and see if guys are doing the right things that we're trying to do as a team. So, so we had the guys, we try to compete every day is, is my point. And we have the guys call their own fouls. Um, and this sometimes leads to disagreements and sometimes leads to fights. I, I haven't found the perfect way to do it, but I really like our team uh, to be edgy and to be to compete when we scrimmage or do a drill. So we pretty much play everything to uh, to a score, um, which uh, we're trying to be really good in our preseason practices right now, sticking to a, a time frame. But there's times where a drill that was scheduled to go. 10 minutes ends up going 25 minutes. And uh, so it's not, it's not exactly what I want. I'm trying to figure out how to do that better, but I, sometimes I let the competitiveness overtake the, even the teaching in a drill or a, uh, or a scrimmage and just let the guys compete because in the end, when we get on the floor um, in a real game, that's what we want to do. So fostering that competitiveness um, to the point of, guys really going at each other. And, uh, you know, we've had situations where that's teetering on going too far or has gone too far. Um, but thankfully this group, um, likes each other enough that afterwards, after a, a tussle or a fight that, uh, we've been pretty good and it's built, um, it's built our team up instead of tearing it down. So talk to me about the ideal personnel then in terms of, moving from that first year to that second year, it's not just a question of finding competitive people. It's also people that fit what you want to do. So what type of personnel maybe were you looking for that might be a little bit different than others? Well, I don't, I don't know that it's different, but I, um, I like guys who can shoot the ball. Um, 
that's been huge for us. Um, just, you know, we, we brought in a, a young guy, Mirko Jarich, who uh, I was lucky enough to coach when he was really young and I was an assistant coach at Townsville. Um, he had been in Serbia. The, the, him coming back and just opening things up, Kuat Noy, another shooter, uh, Majuk Dang, and shooters in every position. Um, so we've had very talented guys, but one of the one of the keys for us last year was just the ability to space and stretch it, and and then have someone who could play out of pick and roll. And we were very fortunate to to have Scott Machado come in and be able to play in the space that these shooters um, provide. So really um, competitive guys defensively who even if we're not perfect on defense, we'll still compete and make a guy uh, take a stand and make a guy go through a body. And then offensively, the ability to to push, uh, play in transition and, and stretch the floor. Um, and then I think a difference for us is that we have Nate Jawai, who's, um, who's one of the biggest guys uh, in the league, pretty much the biggest, I guess, and, and we're able to play through him and he's gifted in the post um, to score for himself and find others. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's more, um, you know, personnel wise, just the, the ability to space and shoot and then, uh, get in that space and, and get downhill and get to the rack with finishers around you or, or have shooters, um, spaced, you know. So another thing you talked about is, uh, the returning players, and uh, clearly a big part of that has got to be mindset. So can you talk about changing mindset in terms of this growth mindset, establishing this winning mindset that, look, what we went through last year, we're not doing that again. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I've mentioned Nate Jawai a couple of times, and he's a great example of this. I think he um, he's a guy who's been, you know, really good at times, played in the NBA, uh, played in the EuroLeague, has been on the national team. And, and then was here in Kansas and has played through some injuries. Um, and he was here when I got here and, and he kind of owns this town. He's got family all over the place. Um, but we had some real run-ins, uh, strong minded guy. We had some real run-ins because he can, he can flat out score in the post, but I, I didn't think it was best for us to just play straight through the post every time he was in the, in the game and he's a very strong personality so when you're losing 14 games in a row and you've got someone like Nate um, he wants to be out there all the time and have the ball go playing through him whether he's shooting it or or passing the ball and I it wasn't best for our group and and as we got more talented last year um this was he was he was kind of the, the the poster boy for the importance of defining the roles in our group and uh, and once Nate bought into uh, being a part of the team as opposed to being the guy that was the man um, and I'm saying this more on the mindset than actually being on the floor and saying I'm the man because there's times when. I want him to touch the ball every time down the floor and I, I want the ball to go through him and him just to dominate the paint. But there's other times where I just want him to be a screen setter um, and roll really hard to the basket, uh, you know, set, set massive screens uh, for these guys to play off of. And I'm using him as an illustration because sometimes it's all, all about Nate for us and sometimes it's not about Nate at all. And we've got a number of guys who are really talented, but they had to learn that it wasn't about them all the time or that it were even better when it's not about them. And so that's, a, I think, a continued teaching point for our group, uh, the belief that even though you're not the man all the time, you're going to um, get what's, what's best for you out of how we go as a team. Um, kind of the philosophy if we if we all play together but don't uh, don't care who gets the credit then in the end we all get paid uh, so clearly uh, 
progress happened in the second year. And now I'm curious, what were some of the things that told you it was on the right track beyond obviously winning? What were some of the other things that said, hey, listen, we've got this turned around. We're in the right direction. Yeah, it took a little bit of time. I, I, we could see that we were talented. Um, we, we still started the season two and six and, uh, and had lost to some teams that we thought we were better than uh, or at least more talented than. Um, and, but there, there was signs that we could, we could score. Um, we just hadn't probably defended consistently. And then we struggled to, um, we struggled to finish games early, uh, finish games. Well, uh, we were, you know, first game of the year, we were up 10 in the fourth quarter and dropped, a dropped a game to the Sydney Kings who were also very talented. Um, but we, we saw the signs that we could be pretty good. And so it was more, again, I go back to role definition. We had two players that were uh, Scott Machado and DJ Newbill, very good with the ball. But as this group was a, basically a new group together, down the stretch, they didn't want to just take over um, and just say, give me the ball, I'm going. Um, they kind of deferred to the offense and deferred to the group and looked over to say, what are we running here? What would you want here? And so we established um, after that game, really, that anytime we're, we're going down the stretch, uh, we defined how we wanted to play better and who we wanted um, to have the ball in their hands to make decisions. Uh, and then it just, you could see it come together when those players who, you know, Scott and DJ, we said, you're going to make the decisions down the stretch. They didn't always make those decisions for themselves. They, I could see they were making the decisions for the team. And, uh, and I think the guys realized that. And it just kind of built from there when guys realized that they were playing for each other and not for themselves. And, uh, and the decisions just built from there. You, you talked, you've said it a few times about role definition. How did you go about establishing roles? How was this communicated with players? There was, there was two ways. Um, first was just a uh, team film where you would, uh, you know, review a game or break down a game. And if I thought it was important that the team knew who we wanted uh, doing things at certain times, um, then, then we would show clips and just talk about situations and say, you get, you have to get the ball back to our point guard here. Um, you know, Scott Machado is the best point guard in the league. Let's get the ball in his hands, your space here. Let's, and we'll make decisions from there. I think too many guys, not necessarily selfishly were, were trying to make plays that they thought could help the team win. So we would do it in film that way. And it, for me, um, I could see that in Scott's eyes and in uh, DJ Newbill's eyes at that time, uh, just kind of the the faith and being told, hey, we want the ball in your hands at this time and this is how we're going to go about things. It just gave them the, you know, the power to say, yep, I, I want the ball here and I'm going to, and they ran with it from there. So that was one way was just having group film sessions and, and establishing exactly what we wanted to happen in certain situations. The other was just um, sitting here in my office individually with guys and telling them what, um, what I expected, listening to them on what their expectations were. And, and because this was a new group, it was, it was being established early. And, uh, and so it was a continual conversation. And then there were times where, it happened out on the floor during games where I didn't like the way a guy was handling himself within the group. And I'm, I'm a pretty low key guy, but there was, I, I can't take unselfishness and I can't, uh, sorry, selfishness, uh, putting someone themselves above the group and I can't take left lack of effort. So when I do go at guys, it's, it's pretty, uh, it can be a little bit personal and I'm thinking of, uh, you know, Mirko is the one I mentioned before. I've known him since he was 17 and, and, uh, was playing 
and I was an assistant. So I kind of treat him like a son at times, but I, I went really hard at him one time. Um, and maybe, maybe even a little bit unfairly, but I, I really went at him to the point where some of the other guys kind of defended him, but we, we made up and it, and it built the relationship, I think with me and him and also with me and the group to say, you can't take yourself out of the group or you can't, um, you know, sulk about your role in any situation. And, uh, Mirko's not like that. Um, and so it was, for me, it was very, uh, strange to see him pull himself away from the group at all. But, um, I think that that was, a we did a good job as a staff. And I think that was one place where I, I did a pretty good job was attacking that as quickly as I could, right when I saw it. So guys knew what to expect. Um, and knew that they were playing for the group and not themselves. So the one big part about role definition is that it's not a one-time conversation, right? It's multiple right. conversations and multiple events and multiple things. So the ongoing process, can you share with that? Because again, especially coming off the season you had, you know, it becomes even more important that uh, roles get bought into. Yeah. And, and I think it's, um, it, it should change, not not only because of um, the group, I guess, and what the group needs, but also we're trying to make these guys better. So if, uh, you know, I have a conversation with our backup three-man who's only playing three minutes a game, and I say, this is what I need you to do, and then he goes out and does it every day in training and also works his tail off to do it in our individual sessions and our small group sessions, and we see development and growth, then then his role's changing. You know, if, if I say to George Blagojevich, hey, if you uh, defend and communicate and rebound on defense, and then offensively you cut hard, you work on your shot so that when you're, you become a dependable catch and shoot guy, and then you offensive rebound, and he does all those things and shows great growth, which which it's easy for me to use him because he is doing that. I've got a responsibility to change his role. And, uh, and he's done all the work to, to steal somebody else's minutes. Um, then his role is going to change. And, and so it is an ongoing conversation, uh, both in, in what the team needs and also how that player develops and, uh, and can help the, the group with that development. Support for the basketball podcast comes from Bet Online. Football is in full effect and the NBA is back. You might not be at a game this year, but you can still be in on the action at Bet Online. Bet Online is going the extra mile to make sure you can get in on everything imaginable this season. From game spreads and totals to team, player, and coach props, Bet Online gives you more options to wager than any place online. Head to Bet Online today and use promo code ARMCHAIR to take advantages of all the great sign-up bonuses. Bet online, your online sports experts use promo code armchair, all in capitals. Listen up, fellows, because today we have a new Manscaped product alert. Manscaped just released the Weed Whacker nose and ear hair trimmer. Take a look in the mirror and I guarantee you'll see hair sticking out of those holes. It's time to keep your ear and nose hair looking as nice as your clean-shaven pubes. Manscaped is forever changing the grooming game with their Weed Whacker. The nose and ear hair trimmer provides proprietary skin safe technology, which helps prevent nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate holes. The premium Manscaped Weed Whacker uses a 9,000 RPM motor powered 360 degree rotary dual blade system. Its intelligently contoured design enhances the trimming experience and it is waterproof, which makes for easy operation and cleaning. Look, fellas, 79% of partners polled admitted that long nose hair is a major turnoff. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code armchair at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code armchair. What are you waiting for? Go whack your weed. Thank you, Manscaped, for keeping our pubes trimmed and hairs in our holes looking nice. Now back to the podcast. So... Role definition, growth mindset, some of these things that led to that, that significant record change 
And then you also talked about keeping it simple. Can you explain what you mean by keeping it simple relative to what you did? Yeah, that was, that was kind of more, um, well, twofold for myself. Um, I think especially as I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going into my third year as a head coach. So it's, uh, when I first got my assistant coaching role, um, coming off of playing, my head was swimming and, uh, you know, we went back to the States and, and I'm, everything's coming at me uh, 100 miles an hour. And what's most important as a coach, as opposed to a player to, to share or to uh, put in a film review uh, or a scout. Uh, right away, it was just what's, what's the most important thing. And, and so keeping it simple um, was very important. And I, and I think, you know, I was very lucky to work for Fred Litzenberger and Dick Hunsaker, and then over here, a bunch of other coaches. Um, but, but basically what I was taught was you do the thing that's most important in front of you and you, you keep it simple. And for me as a head coach, especially coming from, uh, you know, six and 22, I had, I had plenty of people that wanted to help me. Um, and all of it was, uh, you know, well-meaning and, and very good coaches uh, and people that I respect. But there's only so many things you do and so many people's thoughts and, and uh, advice you can take and then distill it down to what's important for your team. So for me, it was, it was almost like uh, using the people I have around me, you know, Jamie and Brad have been here with me the whole time and, um, and so we kind of locked down and, um, reviewed the season really harshly on what we had done and what the players were, had done, uh, from that first year to the second and, and said, this is how we were going to play kind of the things we spoke about and, and competing. And, uh, once we knew we had that group that we liked, it was, it was keeping it simple with that group. And, and so our trainings, um, were a lot of competitive stuff, a lot of playing to get to know each other better. Um, but for me, it was not having a bunch of, you know, I don't have five basketball books open on my, um, open on my desk. It's, it's more figuring out how we want to play and then, and then trying to improve on that little by little. And, and we're still in that, um, that mindset of getting better, but, uh, but doing it without, trying to change all the time. Um, I just had a lot of stuff going, going through my head. And so I had to keep it simple, uh, to move forward simply. Well, it, it's, it's natural for any new head coach to have all these ideas and, uh, you know, to, to want to do all these different things. So I, I know that process is, is really challenging to just say, okay, this is simple and it works. And to keep going back to something that's simple and it works. And sometimes we outthink ourselves as coaches, don't we? For sure. And, uh, and I, I wanted to hear what, you know, what Brian Gorgian said, you know, I played for him, then he was national team coach here. And this great coach who's well-traveled and knows what he's doing. Um, but I'm, I'm not Brian Gorgian. Uh, I'm not Andre Lamanis, uh, and I'm not Dick Hunsaker. So it's taking... I took something from from all of these coaches um, that I respect, and I, you know, we just come off a championship working for Dean Vickerman and Melbourne United, and but but we didn't have the same people that they had there, so we had to to tailor it to us and uh, and stay within our, you know, stay in our lane, I guess you could say, and uh, and do what we do best, and I think that's that's what's been great about this group, and and. Uh, why I'm so stoked to have most of the guys back from last season. Well, it's going to be exciting when you guys get back on the court to see how this season evolves as well. And uh, one other thing that I know you emphasized is the in, focus on improving individually. Like even if your team isn't progressing quite to the win level yet, you can still focus on those individual improvements and notice them. Can you talk about that process? Yeah. Um, Again, again, we do keep it very simple, but it's an everyday thing. Um, and, and this off season especially has been, you know, we've had a, 
eight month off season so far, and we've still got a month and a half or two months to go before we play. But uh, Kawat Noy's been here with us every day for the last eight months. He hasn't gone home, um, and and just with COVID and everything. So, as bad as this off season has been, in in some ways, it's also been fantastic for uh, for our guys to be here with the coaches and just work individually uh, every day and some small group stuff as well. So a lot of shooting, a lot of, um, you know, attention to individual games and uh, and how guys played last year and in the improvements we can make um, using Kawada as an example. Um, he's a very good straight line driver, uh, turns the corner very well. But at times, we'll just run guys over. So the simple, um, you know, simple solution of in every one of his workouts, just not just working on touch shots, but also working on that slight euro or or a way to slow himself down with a stride stop or a jump stop and working that into uh, simple counter moves instead of just straight line drive, drive and try to dunk on guys and getting one or two charges a game. So... Hopefully we, we see results from each player in, in our slight adjustments to their workouts um, and how they went about things uh, or how we went about things every day with those guys in their individual sessions. Uh, and that's, we've got a bunch of young guys. We want guys to come here, um, work with us, play very well, and then go to the next level uh, if they don't come back with us. So there a lot of the players in the NBL have the goal of the NBA still and, uh, and so we're trying to lift these guys up and, and help them get better so they can get there. So take us through maybe the evaluation of what they need to work on. Uh, that comes from game film, discussion with agents, discussion with the players. Can you talk about some of the factors that go into deciding what the actual things they need to improve are, as you said, with the mindset that a lot of them want to get better because they want that shot at the NBA? Yeah. Well, we, um, you know, we do a review say after every game um and i know every team's review is uh is different but uh one co one assistant will do an offensive review um another does a defensive review and and i'll do an individual review and and kind of an overview of the game so that if uh there's something that jamie or brad doesn't pick up or or maybe they do pick it up we'll we'll see you know Hey, did you see this on defense? Did you see this on offense? Let's put that in our review clips and then, and then boil it down to a, a few that we will show the guys um, in team review. And then the individual review, we're just continually looking at our teaching points with each guy and how it relates to the game and, and how, we, how they can be better on the floor, basically. And then all of our, um, the assistant coaches have, have their group of guys and, and I do as well. And we just watch individual clips with them uh, every week. And uh, it doesn't mean we do it after every game, uh, especially if you're playing back to backs, you may not get through every clip, but we want to distill it down to hopefully like five clips um, that, that each player um, can learn from. Some would be things that we've been really trying to go over in their individual sessions. Um, which, which may only be 15 minutes uh, during a training session or before or after a training session, or it could be 45 minutes uh, if, we, if we have time in our training schedule uh, on floor. But just having those five uh, clips to, to reinforce the things that we've been teaching or to, to say, hey, this is something uh, you didn't do well and can do better, um, it's kind of that, that constant... Uh, you know, we do the individuals on the floor constantly, but the film is, is uh, we found it's been pretty good so far. Um, and, and it's hard for me to make these film sessions short, but we're trying to keep them down to like 10 minutes where we meet with guys and we might have three or four uh, in our group. And, and so you just have 10 minutes to 15 minutes with, with each guy watching these clips, but it also is a great time to just check on guys and, and see how they're doing because... Otherwise, it's you fly in, train, go to weights, grab a meal, and you're gone. Uh, and you see the guys on the airplanes and um, kind of in the locker room for a few minutes. But these sessions let us 
watch film with them and also uh, talk about life a little bit. So that's kind of been our, um, you know, our individual system right now. And it, it's, it goes well hand in hand on court and off court. The, the, the smaller group sessions is the value of that. It, do, do players feel more comfortable speaking in those groups because they're a little bit smaller or what are some of the values that come out of doing smaller group well, sessions? Well, we do, we, sorry, I, we do like individuals just one-on-one -on -one with a coach. Oh, okay. Um, I get you. So then, so then it's very, it's very personal. Um, it, it sometimes will turn into small group when, because we kind of do it by position. So I'll have the point guards. And if Scott, Scott Machado has an individual session, Jared Kenny might, might be nearby and just say, I'll sit in and watch Scott's clips as well. So, so they kind of learn off of each other. Um, but we more do the individuals so that because if we don't um, make the time, then, then sometimes you don't touch base or hear how a guy's doing individually, uh, even off the floor. Um, unless you do it on purpose, you might not talk to a guy for, you know, for a week, you might not ask how things are going at home or how his parents are doing those types of things. So we're talking hoops, but we're also, um, touching base on life and, and getting a, you know, a barometer of how the guy's going here in Cairns, which most of the guys are not from Cairns. So it's a, uh, you know, it's a long way from home. Coach, obviously tremendous improvement from year one to year two, and now we're going into year three and now the real coaching starts, right? <laughs> now there's expectations. Now everyone wants to think that, Hey, you can be even better. And, uh, you know, that's exciting. And that's where you want to be as a coach. So talk to me about that process now. Yeah, it's funny, you know, last year going into the season, um, the, the experts, they, they kind of rated the league and said, you know, Sydney and Melbourne are tier one. Um, I don't know. I don't know how it went, but New Zealand and Brisbane are tier two and, and down. And, you know, we only had nine teams and uh, they put us all in a, a tier all by ourselves, like tier five or something. And, uh, and so that was great fuel, you know, for, for our group. And, uh, and when it did come together, it was kind of fun to say, um, you know, that we're, we're kind of making believers out of, out of, uh, people that have picked us so low. So it is a change. Um, not that I, you know, I hope they pick us tier five again to, uh, to keep a chip on guys shoulders. Um, but there is more expectations. And as, as Dean Vickerman said, when, when he first came to Melbourne, like, I like, I like the fact that think people think we should be good now. Um, and we think we have a chance to be pretty good. Well, we know it because these guys that we're bringing back were, uh, were very good last year and gave us a chance, you know, making the playoffs and everything. So the huge difference really from, from a practical point of view is not so much, you know, the first, the second year we improved personnel wise this year, it's, uh, it's improving as a group, like each, each guy improving that little bit. It's, um, you know, being more efficient in how we run things, being more efficient in our pick and roll defense and just getting better at all the little things, uh, hopefully like a continuation of last year um, in getting better. So for us, the big mindset was it, it was like one, one big review after the season once we were able to establish that we were bringing some of the guys back was like, okay, Kawat Noy was solid last year. How do we, how do we make him better? Um, you know, Cam Oliver was very good. How do we help him get even better next year and improve him? So it's been, it's little things on how we're going to get better. And, uh, and so it's been a lot of these individual sessions on the court with guys saying, this is how we're going to do it. You're going to do it better. Let's, um, let's drill this. And then, then off the floor as a group, being able to talk directly from the start on on how we expect to play and um you know if we if we're a little better early and we don't start two and six then we we like our chances as as we get to mid-season to not be coming from behind all the time so um we'll keep a we'll keep a mindset i don't know which one of our players said it last year um but it was something like we don't 
feel pressure, we apply pressure. And so we'll try to keep that mindset as we go forward to, uh, to play with the little chip on our shoulder and to, to be in attack mode, um, but knowing each other a little better. Well, it's, it's, it's such a great story already uh, with your, your experience and the success that's uh, happened already. And uh, I know I'm super excited to be able to watch your league and watch your team play this year and grateful for the opportunity to be able to share the game with you. Thanks for joining us, coach. Thanks, Chris. I'm definitely honored to be a part of your podcast and, and love what you do. So appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show and to give the basketball podcast and this week's guest a shout out on social media to show your support for us sharing the game. And to stay up to date on all things basketball immersion, subscribe to our newsletter at basketballimmersion.com newsletter.